for Colorado Community College, which is a huge partner with us in District 51 and how we work um, with high school students and then their education at, um, at, at the CMU and especially at WCCC. What we're gonna talk to you about today is, is um, an opportunity soon to be offered throughout the state. Um, it's called a Youth Apprenticeship Program. Um, it's developed with a company or a consulting firm called CareerWise, and they're working with us, District 51, as a pilot for this program. And we're actually kind of developing the rural model of what this should look like around the rest of the state as it gets ruled out. Um, just a little bit of history. Um, Governor Hickenlooper um, 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 put together the Bell Commission, and the Bell Commission was about um, education and leadership and what it looks like for kids and they went to Europe um, to, to, to learn about the European apprenticeship model and how it is, is infused in their education system and, and to bring that model or something similar to that model back here in the state of Colorado as a whole um, but like I said District 51 in Macy County is a pilot for that. Um, Denver Public Schools is the other school district. Uh, Sherry Creek, Jeffco, there are some small little charter schools working in this too, but we really are working on the rural model and what that looks like here. And then how we um, uh, work closely with WCCC. Also the Workforce Center, the other gentleman, Curtis Englehart, was with the Workforce Center here, and we're also partnering with them. He's not able to be here today, so we're kind of doing this piece. Um, so that's the brief history, really, a, um, a, a nutshell history of what uh, career-wise, or what we call in District 51, our Youth Apprenticeship Program, and, and how this whole idea, and you have some um, information of a trifold pamphlet in front of you about how high school students will, as juniors, as seniors, um, um, take on real apprenticeships with local businesses and business owners in their um, in the workplace and, and spend you know 15 to 20 hours per week there and then go back to school and get their academic work there too. Um, so, so we have lots of, of business partners involved in this um, and, and, then, and then we're going to continue to grow. You see more about that? I, I just think that District 51 and, and Mesa County specifically has really, I think we're, we're outpacing the rest of the state in this pilot, partly because we are so collaborative. As a rural community, we have to be. And so we worked really hard to work with the businesses. The Chamber of Commerce um, has been extremely involved in this process, so it's been really nice to have businesses and schools and you know both levels of both community college and, and K-12 working together on this process. And I, I really think that we've come up with a, a better system than the front range because of the, our collaboration. Um, the first slide we're going to talk about is is just kind of the why behind the what, um, and, and and many here in Club Twenty that represent the Western Slope, you understand, you know this this talent line, um, this, this talent pipeline that our youth um, um, and, and what the state of Colorado is experiencing here um, over the past number of years, um, and here's the triangle as you guys can see it of every 100 ninth graders that enroll in schools across the state. This is not just in District 51. Um, um, Step, but this is across the state. 77% graduate from high school. Um, that number is actually up a little bit this year for the state of Colorado, somewhere around 79%. But, 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 but really, you know, eight out of ten kids graduate from high school. Um, 43 enroll in some kind of credit-bearing institution, um, college, um, two-year degree at WCCC or Colorado Northwestern or whatever that looks like um, for us. Um, 34 re return for the next year of their program. And then just 23 of those original 100 freshmen um, graduate from um, college and on time. That's a four-year grad rate. You know, some of us took longer in college, um, but but that that's a four-year grad rate. But but that's really you know the impetus of this is how do we grow our own work development and emerging workforce talent? How do we educate that talent? And then how do we keep them here in the state of Colorado or locally into Mesa County or into each of your counties as it comes out? Um, and, 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 and that's the whole impetus of this. Now, you know, you know, the metro area has lots of, um, of, of uh, more diverse opportunities, I think, you know, for work, you know, but for us, it's about how do we educate our talent, how do we develop our talent, you know, as a workforce, you know, and then how do we keep them here? 
you know, one of the things that, that, that Dennis and I spend a whole lot of time on is really emerging workforce, you know, and that emerging workforce, and then how that relates into economic development, you know, recruitment, and all those pieces. And so we're, we're partners with not just WCCC, but the Workforce Center, uh, the um, uh, local chamber of commerce um, and economic development to make sure, you know, or try to instill and grow our own a little bit. So that's a little bit about, about the why. Um, here's a small thing, you know, and I'm not going to read this to you, but it just says the same thing. We're not doing our best job about helping youth discover the opportunities that they have locally and what that looks like for us. And so, and so this is a way for the state of Colorado and school districts to engage kids at an early age you know, by the time they get to be 16 or 17, give them some real work experience in a job and, um, and also educate them at the same time. You know, the kid's going to earn a, a, a wage, you know, while they're there. They're going to get high school credit. They're going to get um, secondary ed credit, you know, you know, throughout the program based on where they're at. Okay? So, again, it's just about, you know, grow our own talent, attract the best talent, and then keep it. Um, the career-wise mission, and remember, this is the consulting firm that's organizing all this, you know, and helping us out. Um, and over on the right-hand side, you can see we, we create two- to four-year apprenticeships for students in businesses and what that looks like. Um, one of the things that we talk about here in, 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 in Mesa County is it's not just the academic growth of our students, but also that, 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 that social and emotional growth of our kids, really, and those work-ready skills. Uh, we did some community outreach work uh, for the last couple of years, and we talked to parents, you know, and they, and business owners and, and leaders in the community about what they want from a District 51 um, graduate. And, and invariably, it was about, are these kids ready to come to work? Do they have the work-ready skills? Can they work in a team? Are they creative? Are they dependable? All those things, you know, and, and it was one of those things that this, this program really does help define and instill some of those skills you know, in, in our kids. Um, and then give them real life or real world job experience. So, so all those things add up. Anything else? So what I would add is that Matt and I were fortunate enough to go to Switzerland to look at their um, process. And this is based on the Swiss model. And we're taking it and modifying it. In Switzerland, 95% of their students get at least an associate, what is equivalent to an associate degree through this process. About 75% of their students go through an apprenticeship program. There's a, about another 10% or so who go through the traditional get a, get a bachelor's degree route. But they've built a system that's permeable so a student can start an apprenticeship and get a PhD if they want. It's not You're not tracked into something. It's permeable so that you can make a switch from an apprenticeship to a traditional model. You can go back and forth, and we didn't put it up on the system. You know, there's this whole diagram. We saw probably 10 different versions of this, how permeable this is. But that's what we're trying to do, is that give these youth an apprenticeship. So start out with some career assessment. Help them figure out what careers they want. Get them into an apprenticeship. Let them grow. Get an associate degree through that process so that they can also transfer them to get a bachelor's degree if they want to do that. So we're trying to build a permeable system. We're lucky in Mesa County in that between District 51, Western Colorado Community College, and CMU, there's already a permeable system. CMU offers a Bachelor of Applied Science. So a student can get an associate degree in welding and get a bachelor's degree. That's not true in every state. There's a lot of places where if you get a bachelor's degree, if you want to get a four-year bachelor's degree, you have to start over from ground zero. We're really lucky that CMU has built that process so it allows students who go to a community college to get that bachelor's degree. And that's something that we're trying, this system will allow that student to maybe stay in welding, but they can then go get some leadership so that they can run the firm as opposed to just being the welder kind of stuff. And so that's what the bachelor's degree does. And so we're really, that collaboration in the educational system, at least in Western Colorado, has been really nice and it will help our students kind of grow around from that piece and get some quality to it. You know, this next slide is just kind of, a, um, um, you know, the, the um, advantages to business owners and, and, and business leaders and also advantages to the students, you know, when it comes to this. You know, again, I'm not going to read those to you, um, but, but, but you can look down. And, and, and one of the things that we really, um, when we're recruiting businesses for this, 
you know, one of the things we really like to emphasize is how they're building and developing and growing their own talent and then being able to retain the talent. You know, so, so, so they do have an idea, because if we have, and Lewis Engineering is, is, is one of the um, business partners that we have, um, you know, working with us, you know, those students are going to be working alongside with those active and practicing engineers, doing the work, designing the work, seeing it's developed, you know, that whole process, you know, and then, and then they develop those um, um, skills that they want in an employee, and, and whether or not they keep them, you know, for three years or four years, they have a pretty good employee for that amount of time, for that amount of money. So, so there's lots of be um, benefits to, to employers, but it is about developing work ready skills and about having a pipeline of work readiness um, and employees as they develop their own. Um, some of the ones on the student side I already talked about, this is not gonna work. Um, the, the, the kids are actually, um, the kids are actually earning the wage. Um, it's based on minimum wage, you know, but, but at the same time, they're actually earning high school credit and they're getting college credit um, or potentially earning college credit at the same time. I, I would add to the hard part, when we were in Switzerland, we were in Zurich, and so we saw all these big, huge businesses that could have, I mean, some of them had 30 and 40 apprenticeships. That's not going to happen in rural Western Colorado. So what was nice, I think, for both Matt and I is to try to figure out how to translate that system that is a nationwide system into a state system, but also how does it work in a rural community. And we didn't see too many mom and pop things, but we also saw lots of ways that you could take like the Swisscom, which is their biggest telephone company, and how they have a business within a business that they do these IT projects. And they employ the apprenticeships, or the apprentices, and if then somebody gives them a project, and those apprentices get that project. It could be for Swisscom, it could be for a small company outside of Swisscom. So we, we came back with, how do we help the businesses in Mesa County specifically, who are not huge. I mean, Lewis Engineering took on, I think, two apprenticeships this, this year, and they have about 45 employees. We have some others that are smaller than that. How do they do that? And so really, how do we translate this Swiss model to a, to a rural model? And I think that's what we're working on. We also realize that Grand Junction has advantages that some of the smaller communities outside of Grand Junction don't. We had two people from um, Garfield County go with us. Um, that they're looking at what does it look like next year, and they had to, you know, they don't have the manufacturer maybe that Grand Junction does. So how do we do translate translate these apprenticeships to small mom and pop shops that may have five or ten employees? How do you do that? And so that's what we we're working with these companies, and the top the top row specifically are companies in Grand Junction who are taking on apprenticeships for us um, starting this fall. And we're, we're shooting for 35 apprenticeships this fall in Mesa County. Both Matt and I are going to be hiring apprenticeships. Um, to do that, we decided we needed to join in. And so um, my case specifically, WCC is taking on a manufacturing apprenticeship. And so it's, you know, they're going to start out in the program as a high school student learning to be a machinist. And as they work their way through, they're going to get projects both from the graduate students at CMU and engineering. Uh, as well as outside groups where they can actually do real world manufacturing um, and machining pieces as they go through the process. Um, I think you guys are doing a business services and an IT. Yeah, we're going to have two apprentices. Um, one is going to work in our business financial department um, for the school district, the other one is going to work in the, our, our um, um, instructional technology department, um, doing just, just IT support work um, you know, with, with computers um, and technology. So, so two different apprentices. Um, one of the things that is, is very diverse here is that we're going to have um, um, students in banks. The Bank of Colorado has, has taken on apprentices, community hospital, although we can't work on the clinical side of a hospital, we can work on the support side of the hospital, so they're taking on um, um, students to work in their um, financial support or billing support or those kinds of things, um, and also their, their IT support. DT Swiss is one of our um, advanced manufacturers here in town. They do great, um, they, they produce um, advanced um, um, bicycling parts and things like that. Um, you know, and, and there's some other ones you know, as well. So it's a very broad piece. We've had lots of interest from, from other businesses, you know, but I'll be honest and tell you that some of these businesses are waiting to see how this shakes out. You know, and that's okay. I mean, because what, what we do now, um, you know, you know, Dennis said that we're trying to shoot for like 35 apprentices, and, and that number would be nice, but 
to me, success isn't going to be measured in how many apprentices we have. It's the success of those apprenticeships in those businesses. And that's going to what's going to define success for us as, as we move forward here. Um, we also started only in four areas. So manufacturing, machining, health, um, IT, business services, and financial services. So we only shot for, five, for four areas. In, in Mesa County, we talked about healthcare, which is the state. That's not where they went. We're, we really think that healthcare in Grand Junction specifically is a perfect place. We have to figure out what that path would look like so that students can maybe do some customer support. You know, they're right at the front desk helping people find the right room in a hospital, and then how do you get them We're actually working with patients? So how do we build a pipeline so that a student gets a CNA license and then maybe gets a, an LPN and then gets an EMT or something like that? But we have to figure out how to build that pipeline. But we start with four, just four areas. So it's, we have one that's manageable. Um, uh, when we went to Switzerland, um, representatives from the trade unions, um, the, the construction trade unions, were there as well. You know, and there are some barriers to getting, um, you know, seventeen-year-olds on a construction site and how you can get them there. But, but, but they're very interested in this model also. And how do we start to build electricians and plumbers and pipe fitters and HVAC kids? You know, and how we build them in, into careers early. You know, we give them job skills. You know, I was an electric apprentice for for eight months um, between uh, um, getting out of the service and going to school. You know, and I've used those skills my whole life. And so those kids, even though they don't become an, um, an electrical engineer, you know, they're still going to have those skills and they can go another direction. So, so those, those pieces, I think, are hugely valuable to, 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 to very motivated, you know, 17, um, 16, 17, and 18 year olds. Um, our challenge as a school district is going to be academically scheduling these kids in between the, um, the, um, the rigors and the, and, and, and the, the desires for their jobs and in the community. You know, because they're going to have to be able to, you know, go to work, you know, and meet that schedule and, and, and what that looks like, but then they're also going to have to graduate from high school. You know, so, so it's going to be a very unique challenge for us to try to schedule those students to be able to meet the demands of, of their job as well and the demands of, of going to, um, you know, college. Because the third year of this apprenticeship is after high school, and so there's going to be that third year component is going to be some kind of enrollment in a post-secondary program. WCCC, it can be CMU, it can be other pieces, but they're going to have to enroll in another um, post-secondary program to complete the third year of the apprenticeship, which is also a unique piece to this puzzle. Um, this is pretty busy, you know, but, you know, and I don't have this one for you, but it just talks about the four, oops, you know, the four um, um, career pathways, advanced manufacturing, information, financial services, business operations, and then what it looks like, you know, in every year, you know, year three or year four. So, and what those goals are for each of those students as it moves forward. Um, um, this is just kind of a layout of the pilot programming, um, of the pilot areas um, for this program for the first year. Um, like I said, the metro area is very involved. Um, DPS was really a school district, but Cherry Creek has also kind of jumped on board. Jeffco has always also jumped on board to this. Mesa County, um, School District 51 is, is a part of that piece. Um, actually, that, that one on the bottom in, um, in, in the Lamar, Lamar um, they kind of dropped out. You know, so we picked up some other pieces. There are some pieces up in um, um, the Fort Collins, Greeley area, that, uh, and some charter schools are guess taking on this role too. And remember, this is a pilot. We're all, um, we're all trying to build this as we go. You know, about 18 months ago, your governor, you know, tossed this plane in the air and we're sitting here trying to build it and fly it and what this looks like. But this is a huge opportunity for students and kids, a huge opportunity for, for the state of Colorado and also for, you know, businesses and business leaders, you know, to be able to do this. You know, it's about creating great um, um, opportunities for students but it's more about developing an emerging workforce. It's more about training and, and, and retaining that emerging workforce here in the state of Colorado. Okay, um, last slide, there's just some contact information. Um, but if you have some, you know, some in, individual questions, you know, I have my cards. Um, there, there, there's contact information in the brochure that you guys have. And that really is just kind of a thumbnail sketch of, of what this looks like for us. Anything else? How about questions? Let's do that. Yes, sir. 
Did a pilot program come with some funding from the state? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it did. There were some startup funds. You know, you, you he got some. I didn't. <laughs> That's great. But yeah, um, there were some startup funds, um, and, and the Daniels Fund, which is one of the um, corporate um, sponsors, have also um, you know, de 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 developed some funds. Business owners will pay the wage, okay, so they're, so, so they're on the hook to pay minimum wage for these students. You know, we're on the hook to provide the opportunities for these, good, um, these kids to, to, to educate them, you know, and, and to get them through, um, through um, high school, and then to get them into college. You know, you know, so 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 it is really a very um, a very diverse partnership when it comes to working with businesses and working with our students. The other thing is that businesses and education work together on competencies. So there's a there's competencies that each one of the four areas those students have to meet as they go through their apprenticeship. And at any point, they're not meeting competencies. Example: not showing up to school, not showing up on time to work. The company can say, "I'm sorry, you're out of here." So the, the company has control on who they hire for their apprenticeship and also letting them go if they don't meet some of the competencies, whatever they may be. And we're, all three of us are responsible for those companies. So some in the K-12 level, some at the community college, and some at the business have to meet those competencies, and we're all responsible for them. But the business ultimately has the yay or, yay or nay kind of say on who they hire. Go ahead. So, sure, I mean, what's the examples of uh, uh, students that are engaged in the apprenticeships that uh, are working with an employer where it, it's just not a good match? It may not necessarily be the case that mm -hmm. that uh, the apprentice slash student uh, isn't showing up and isn't trying hard. It just doesn't work out. Sure. Uh, presumably, these students get a second chance. They can. They can actually move to a, apply for another apprenticeship. Or they could move to the higher education piece. I mean, there's lots of different options, at least in the Swiss model. And we heard, I'm, I'm sure we saw the best and the brightest of some of the apprentices, but in a week, I was impressed with every single apprentice that walked in. And these were what would be 11th graders in our system, sometimes 10th graders. And they were impressive young people. Their, their presentation, I mean, in another language, you know, they were presenting in English in a lot of cases, their knowledge their professionalism, their responsibility. It was just, it was pretty amazing. And as educators, that was kind of nice to see that taking responsibility. And in Switzerland, they have 250 different apprenticeships. So they've really developed it everywhere from hospitality and retail to medicine and, and stuff. So they've found a way to do different apprenticeships in different areas. And all of them, if you don't meet the competencies, you move on. Or the student can say, you know, Machine, it's not me. I want you to change. It's easy to switch. You know, one of the key pieces to this is that employers are doing the recruiting, employers are doing the screening, employers are doing the hiring. You know, you know when we first started think, think, thinking about this, you know, it's not up to schools to recruit and place kids where we think they best fit based on a career pathway, career interests. You know, students are actually getting online. Um, you know, researching the employers, we had a job, um, 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 a, a research open house job fair just last week, and we had um, eight employers there, um, and we had about 80 kids show up for two hours. It was at the Workforce Center, Curtis Engelhart, the guy um, um, hosted it, and it was a great event for, for students to actually go to talk to the folks at DT Swiss and talk to the, um, the folks at Coors Tech and talk to the folks at, at, at Lewis Engineering and talk to folks at WCCC and District 51 about what those opportunities are for them. And they were doing their research and they can apply and they'll get screened and businesses will do the hiring and the firing. Because we understand there's gonna be some attrition. There's some attrition in, in, in Europe. I mean, this is a model in Europe that's been going on for hundreds of years, really. You know, and, and it, it's part of their culture. It is part of their social fabric. We're just starting to build this here in, 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 in Colorado. You know, so it's gonna take a little while for parents and students and businesses you know, you know, to, to, to understand what this does, you know, and, and the positive outcomes for everybody involved. Yes, sir. Um, under the theory that some people support that not all kids are meant to go to college, it, is there another one of this that you could call a whole or maybe that's what, what it is? I think very much so. I think, I think the conversation nationally, as a public educator for 30 years, the conversation nationally about not every student is college bound. You know, and what that looks like, and the opportunities for a two-year or an 18-month, you know, some kind of um, 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 
um, work ready certification or credential that, 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 that they can use up front, you know, because there are so many jobs now, the jobs that we don't know about, you know, in the next 20 years are just going to take, you know, an additional two years of training, not a four year college education. So that's an option that you have, you just don't call it Votech yet. Well, we call it current technical education, but yeah, it's vocational education. Yeah, and it's there's new research to show that a two year associate degree in a career technical area like welding or automotive actually has more long term advantages than a four year bachelor's degree. And, and I'm obviously biased because I work at a community college, but the new research is showing that that's the new, that more people are wanting to go back to those kinds of trades, um, kind of careers than, than it has been. But our society still says a four year degree is where you should move to, and if you get a two year, you're not as good. But as long as that doesn't scare them. Yeah. Thank you for that explanation. Sure. What well, I was, I had the opportunity to sit in on some of the meetings last spring in Here's the, the legislature. <laughs> Sorry. I, I had the opportunity to sit in on some of the meetings on on the apprentice program last uh, last year uh, in the legislature and was very very impressed. Um, and I think it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. I, I think it'll be great, you know, especially maybe, well, there's kids right here in Grand Junction, but in, in downtown Denver, um, uh, you know, kids that just flat don't have a chance that might learn how to work and, mm -hmm. and stay out of gangs and, and do some things like that. But one of the things that was interesting to me, and maybe you can... Uh, expand on it is in Switzerland you play by the rules and you don't go to school and uh, if I remember right and uh, and uh, you know I just think that we have it here kids that say oh man I have to go to school and in Switzerland they say oh man I, I want to go to school and we need to change that attitude here in the United States and go ahead and comment on that. Nope. You're, you're very right, and one of the things that we saw, and I was very impressed with you know, when we went to Switzerland, was how their, their, their work, their apprenticeship, whatever they were doing was, was closely tied and very relevant to the education that they received in the high school. And so that's what makes kids want to go to school, is the relevance. They understand, they understand when they walk in the door, and Mr. Trujillo will tell you all about this, they understand when they walk in the door why I'm here and what I'm going to accomplish today and what that's going to mean for me in, 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 in my job, in my employment, in my career, and what that looks like. And that's that relevance piece. And, and I've been doing this for 30 years, you know, and, 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 and that's sometimes been a struggle for public education. It's how do you make things real and relevant and make students want to show up every day and make it worth their while every day and what do I get at the end of the day? You know, so those are the pieces that I think that, that these kinds of programs truly begin to instill in students because a young man that's going to Lewis Engineering, you know, he's going to have lots of math, lots of science, you know, but he'll understand the value of that and why I have to go sit through calculus, you know, why I have to go through sit through physics, you know, when I apply those skills to my job at Lewis Engineering when I'm designing, whatever I'm designing, or DT Swiss, or, or advanced manufacturing, like at WCCC. So it's that relevance piece that sometimes we struggle with as public educators. I, you know, you guys can go back to your high schools, you know, in your school districts in each of your counties, and I would guess that at some form or fashion they tell you that. You know, and how do you do that? And how do you create that piece? You know, career technical ed is, is one of the things that keep kids there because those, 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 those lessons and those classes are relevant to them. Another example, and I'll pick on Wes, you know, his, his, his kids at Cedar Ridge High School were very involved in, in FFA, Future Farmers America. It was an agricultural program, you know, and, and, and Les was, uh, he, he raised a couple of sheep in his lifetime. You know, but, but, but there was relevance in that, in, that, um, in, in that coursework at Cedar Ridge High School about how you do, you know, you know, agricultural and land management and what that looks like. And so there was relevance there, and that's the piece that I think sometimes we miss. And, and I, I'm a kid. I grew up in Grand Valley, ran sheep and cattle, or, you know, as a kid. And, and I didn't see what I, in, what I saw in Switzerland is what I didn't see as a kid growing up here. That I think the apprenticeship will bring to, the, to, the, to my community that there's different options for students. You can be in that, that track where you can get a PhD, or you can be in that track where I'm, I'm going to be a welder and I'll have my own business. And I think we're, we're offering 
this apprenticeship offers the whole thing through. And we saw students in Switzerland who said, you know, I didn't really like school until I started my apprenticeship and realized that what I'm learning in class is what I'm using every day. And we heard that over and over again, whether it was a retail apprentice or it was an IT apprentice. They, they finally saw the relevance in the education. And it was really neat to watch that because that's rare. I didn't realize what I learned in high school would help me in college until I was out of college, to be honest with you. So I mean, it was nice to see that they were making those connections um, before I, I ever did as a kid. So. So, quick question. Um, I know that the program takes the educational piece and a student goes to school for a couple days a week and learns um, some of the, the more um, thought-related uh, theories and then puts them into uh, application in the apprenticeship. So, does the business who hosts the apprentice have to sit down with the uh, school district and the college to develop a curriculum? Or is that something that's put together by you all with just some kind of benchmarks of these are what the student needs to be learning in their apprenticeship? So, so each, uh, speak from the college, you can speak from the, the industry and, and the college specifically have developed what we're calling competency crosswalks. So the, the industry, let's say manufacturing, machining, they set up some competencies to be a successful machinist in, in a business. And it's a statewide discussion. So there's a professional organization that did that. They then gave us the competencies. And what we did in manufacturing specifically is took all of our courses and mapped the competencies where we were teaching those in, in our courses. And then the businesses are mapping where they teach it along the way in their training process. So we've got this competency piece in manufacturing that I can show where students are getting those competencies in every course that we teach along the way. So we're matching up what you need in the industry piece with what we're teaching for the degree, which luckily community colleges have advisory committees and we've done that a long time ago, but it was just formalizing it. And then I think the K-12 level is, what's the, the piece you need to graduate, but also are there pieces where they're meeting those competencies, like per, personal responsibility, they're showing up on time kinds of stuff, because it's, there's a different piece each one of us picking up along the way. You know, additionally to that, then, you know, that's where the, the role of some of the professionals at CareerWise help us crosswalk those competencies between a high school curriculum and the standards or the competencies they're going to learn in the, in the workplace. Okay, so, so they have some specialists actually working with us to develop that curriculum that interfaces between high school and also the, the, the workplace very specific to the job and very specific to the career pathway. So engineers, the financial sector um, um, folks, um, the IT folks, those are very specific competencies and how do they crosswalk to the learning that they have in high school. So, so, so students see that, parents will see that, and then we start to develop that, that, that relationship or that relevance that we were talking about because kids know this is why I'm doing, I'm, 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 I'm learning this in this class at this time you know, and how that's going to prepare me for success in my job that I'm doing right now, you know, and then develop those work skills, you know, because, you know, no matter what, kids are going to graduate from high school, they're going to graduate from college and go to the service or whatever, eventually they're going to hope they're going to be in the workplace, and they're going to have to have those work ready and those, those workplace skills, you know, and the sooner we teach them that, the better. In, in Switzerland, we saw each of the apprenticeship sites, the students have to document how they met some of the competencies. Now it's signed off by the either industry or the school system, but they had full, had each year they had to go through those competencies and document how they met them. Um, and so it was really nice. And when there's a conversation, like the student doesn't show up for work on time or doesn't show up for school on time, there's a group who sits down with them both at the school and the and the company because they take responsibility and say you're not you're not meeting, you know, the showing up on time piece of it, and so we're giving you one more shot or we're letting you go. But it's a, com it's a conversation with school and industry or the apprenticeship site to do that together. So they, they've figured out a process how to do that, that we are going to kind of work out and punt on, I'm sure, on several occasions. Cause it's going to take, it's, it's mm -hmm. take some time to develop this to the machine and to the level that, you know, you know the Swiss and the Germans and, 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 and the Austrians. You know, you know that have done this for a number of centuries, really, 
and decades, you know. So we've been doing it for a couple of months, and we're just trying to figure some of those things out. One over here first. So, right here, and then we'll go down there. Um, yeah, so I, I, this is bringing experiential education to a really practical level, which is exactly. awesome. Exactly. So I really like the fact that they are, the kids were out there when I took a break, um, putting in the school garden, they were putting in hoop house, so they were mixing cement and doing math, so that was really great for me to see. Mm -hmm. Two things, one, I would love to see it expand beyond those four um, areas, and I'm sure you have plans for this, and particularly yeah. to the FIA and the agricultural part, um, that where we really need um, workers as well. But then my question is, what is the, um, what's the trajectory, what's your time, and what's next for you? How long is this pilot project? Um, when do you see that expansion happening, assuming everything goes perfectly? Um, we hope to expand into healthcare next year. You know, and, and, but, but we also want to expand um, um, our, our current offerings in the current um, career paths as we have, because we have more engineering firms and we have more banks and we have more um, um, advanced manufacturing firms here in Mason County and around you know, you know, to, to expand that more. So, so it, initially, we, we hope to get between 30 and 40 apprenticeships next year, um, but then the following year, it's gonna be 30 and 40 more, you know, and hopefully it grows and grows and grows. You know, we're in this for the long haul, you know, because this is a, 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 an initiative developed, you know, through the Colorado Department of Labor, the grant that we talked about, the startup funds came from the Federal Department of Labor. Um, and so, and so this is something that, that, that the state of Colorado was committed to. We just happen to be at the, um, the cutting edge of this. And the model that we produce in schools, the model that we produce in, in, in community colleges and post-secondary ed is the model that, 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 that your school districts you know, can pick up on you know, and do. Because this isn't something that's just going to happen in Mesa County or in the metro area. This is something that's supposed to happen statewide. One of the goals that we learned about is that is is that in, in ten years, you know, you know, Governor Hickerlooper wants to see twenty or twenty five thousand apprenticeships statewide. That's a lot of businesses, that's a lot of students, you know, and that's a lot of work by a lot of good folks to try to make that happen. So so we're in this for the long haul. We're just kinda do, 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 developing the toolkit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, developing the toolkit. So 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 um, um, the, the the folks in Garfield County, um, the folks um, um, up in Roy Fork High School um, um, school district, you know, uh, we're going to jump on next year. Um, we're already talking to the folks in Delta County and Montrose County, you know, the ones locally around us about what this might look like for them, you know, just as the folks in the metro area are talking to, you know, surrounding counties, you know, and surrounding opportunities because, you know, this, this is an opportunity that's just started for a few kids this year, but in 10 years it should have be happening for 25,000 kids. <coughs> so, <coughs> we were starting to answer my question, which is the part about rolling it out to other school districts. And, and it is nice to know that uh, your school district of uh, 21,000 students is the pilot for a rural program. Uh, I guess I'm curious how that I think that's where they look at it in Denver. I'm not sure we look at it like that. Yeah. And I, I guess I'm struggling to uh, imagine what this would look like for my school district of about 350 students. So for, for me specifically, um, WCCC is working really close with Montrose County Schools right now, and we're developing some programs similar to what we do for District 51. And I've been talking to the superintendent and the principals about what is it looking like here to kind of help them start thinking about what it will look like in Montrose and, and talking about what businesses we go after. So I think it's, we, we then need to help smaller districts do that. We had some, like I said, Garfield went with us on the trip to Switzerland, and we had some conversations with the principal um, at in Garfield, specifically about how does it work in Glenwood? They don't have maybe the manufacturing that we do, so how do we translate that? And I think that's the thing that I learned. And when I was on the tour, ETH, which is the university in Switzerland that was our sponsor, had apprenticeships that are doing exactly what I'm going to do at WCCC. So it was taking that and going, aha, I can translate that, and I can offer an apprenticeship because I'm going to support this. So we're offering one specifically based on the Swiss model from what I saw, but the university probably has 35,000 students. I have 3,500. So how do I translate that and do it? And so we're going to have to do some translation from even from Grand Junction to, to your 300 students. How do you translate what we're doing? It's going to be modified because it can't be the same in Denver as it is in Grand Junction or as it in Craig or Meeker or someplace like that. So we really have to talk to each other and figure out how, to, how does each place do it a little differently. 
you know, part of that expansion is going to be about what kind of business pathways and career pathways we define for students. You know, so, so I can tell you, when we were in Switzerland, we saw retail, we saw um, tourism, um, culinary arts, we saw uh, um, hospitality, we saw um, um, you know, auto mechanics, you know, as another example. So as we expand here, this is just the first you know, you know, shot at this. And for, for, for small districts in small counties and small rural areas, rural areas, very small, it's going to be about some of those, some of those businesses that have those opportunities you know, to give them to kids. So, so it, it is, but it's going to be about expansion of opportunities and career pathways as much as it is about just expanding into um, the state geographically. This is real. As you can imagine now, I'm very enthusiastic about this. I have a long experience clear back to your tech in, in both days. Yeah. One of the things that I really noticed when I first became interested in it, well, and I was teaching American history. Now, that's a little hard. To, but students who went to UTech and, and began to do career programs would come back to my classroom and be better students. They just had sort of an idea of this is how the world works. I so I think it isn't always just a direct, you know, well, I'm welding and so I know this and that. Welding had nothing to do with American history, but I, I think it's tremendous. I always have it. You're just building up. Another step here. We well, teach problem solving skills and critical thinking and welding as much as they do in history. So, you know, I think I think in every high school across the nation, some form of career and technical education program exists. You know, so that you know it, it it's limited just because of size and resources and space and things like that. But 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 Marshall makes a great point. Career and technical ed. You know, real life experiences, you know, getting real skills to develop, you know, over a period of time, whether it's in a business curriculum class, or it's a culinary arts class, or it's a, a wood shop um, 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 construction tech class, or any one of the CTE programs at WCCC that our students, you know, have, have, have access to. That kind of relevant learning, that kind of relevant instruction is what, it, it is what make kids, you know, um, um, a, a lot more productive in their future, whatever their job is going to be because they have those skills and develop those. So career and technical education is something I've worked on hard in my role as a director of the high schools here in town to develop those opportunities and options for kids, not just at WCCC, but in each high school, you know, what it looks like. I, I would encourage you to go back to your, your communities, and if there's a community college in the area, get your high schools to start talking to the community college. We're really fortunate in Grand Junction that District 51 and Mesa College, now Western Colorado Community College, have had a cooperative program since my dad was in high school in Florida in the 50s. My dad took a class at Mesa and Otto as a high school kid. I was able to do some of the same stuff as a high school kid, right? The bus took me to Mesa College every day. We're still doing it. And, that, and I think that cooperative piece, you can start there. It doesn't have to start with an apprenticeship, but what kind of opportunities can you give your high school kids that maybe is at the local community college or at a local educational institution, or even if it's online. There's ways we can start this without doing an apprenticeship, and then we can move into that. But we, we're started with a cooperative that's pretty easy to kind of jump off with this, because 500 high school kids from Mesa County every day come to Western Colorado Community College to get CTE education. So we've had it for, for decades. And we're just, this is another block in that building cooperation and opportunities for kids. You know, another thing I would encourage you to do, and I can't overemphasize this enough, here in Mesa County, it's not just a partnership between Colorado Mesa College, WCCC, and District 51. You know, Grand Junction Chamber of Commerce is very much at the table. Our Mesa County Workforce Center is very much at the table. Um, Grand Junction and Mesa County Economic Development and, and Emerging Workforce is very much at the table. This is a community effort. By, by everybody in Mesa County to jump on board and, and, and be involved in this because they understand the value to our, to our students and our youth, but they also understand it as a value as an economic tool, an economic development recruiting tool, and, and to build those, the, those pipelines for that workforce that we're gonna need in the future. You know, so, so it really is a community effort, and it's not just an educational effort, but it's a community effort that, that everybody's been involved in over the last, really, just Boy, four or five months since we you know, just learned about what career-wise was, you know, to get to the point where we are now, which is recruiting, talking, getting kids in front of business owners, and having them, you know, sign up and and, and um, um, 
be selected for apprenticeships. So it, it has been kind of a nice thing. Yes, ma'am. Yes, and for those of you who really are interested in this, I can tell you personally, I've never been so excited about the direction of education as I have been. I got the opportunity to go to the Swiss Embassy this last summer uh, with CareerWise and learn a little bit more about this. And I've personally never been so excited and so engaged in education. Um, we, as a leadership group, decided that our spring conference will be focused on quote unquote economic development. But really, the direction we're taking with the spring conference is how to grow our own and develop our own business leaders. And the leaders of CareerWise will be at our spring conference. So those who are interested in trying to implement something similar in their communities can sit down with those leaders and really pick their brains and figure out how you can get this going in Route County or Moffat County or San Miguel County, uh, whichever the case may be. So please come to the spring conference and you'll have the opportunity to visit with them. And then once you have those conversations, give us a call. You know, because I can talk to, to superintendents and, and central administrators and high school principals about how we kind of got this going, you know, because we are in this together, you know, and we do need to share this toolkit that we're developing, you know, with, with the people across the state, and, you know, and, and particularly with the Western Slope. You know, I've been here for a long time, and, you know, and we're all on this side of the divide together. You know, so we have, to, we have to share with each other the knowledge that we are, you know, trying to build here so that we can all be successful doing this. And I think we would all be willing to come out and meet with groups. I, mean, I think Matt and I, you know, you can play us a nice consulting fee if you want, but we're willing to come do it for free. Because we, I went to Switzerland kind of going, hey, is this going to work? And I left going, wow, this is awesome. So I really, I'm glad your spring conference is going to talk about it, but it's, it's something that kind of changed my thinking about, I mean, I've been a career tech guy for a long time. I'm obviously worked in community colleges for about 25 30 years, believed in it. This just added another layer that I think is incredible for students. The, the career decision-making process that they go through, then the apprenticeship, and then actually going to work while they're still in school and seeing the value of just, I went, whoa, okay, we need to do this. So I think we're committed to, to not only rolling it out here, but how do we roll it out in smaller communities in Grand Junction. So we're here to help. Matt, Dennis, thank you very much. And we didn't play that group much closer. We have on the line right now our next present presenter, uh, Katina Deeper, who is the Chief Policy Officer with CCHE. And she's going to talk about the master plan and the le and, uh, legislative update. So I understand you're on the line. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, talk. I think we're trying to turn the mic on. Nice to see with you all this afternoon. And I appreciate Derek inviting me to join you. Um, and if at any point in time for some reason you can't hear me, please do let me know. Um, we do not have much of a legislative agenda for this legislative session. Uh, I did share with Tanya yesterday for Bill Dragon, less of the bills that are out there currently impacting higher education. Uh, our legislative agenda is very significant is three very technical bills. One has to do with relocating the Colorado Youth Leaders Institute program from Lieutenant Governor Davis to the Department of Higher Education. When that program was first implemented, Joe Garcia was our Lieutenant Governor and he was our Executive Director. Uh, the advocate really wanted that program in his office. Now that we have a new Lieutenant Governor with a different focus, um, it seems more, much more appropriate to place with that. Uh, that's Senate Bill 50. It has passed uh, the Senate and has made a way for how to expect to see it on the floor in the near future. Um, we also have a profit administration bill from several years ago, which is the entity and statute uh, dedicated to administer the College Opportunity Fund program. They are the division of our department. And a couple of years ago, we tried to create some greater efficiency in our workload. Uh, we worked out a new arrangement for how that program can be managed. Just so much of our finance team the department is managing the program now. And when they went through their financial audit a couple of years ago, we talked about whether or not 
They actually have statutory authority to delegate it back to the department. Uh, we had argued that their decision of the department is to extend the needed share of the work in DC. But uh, in the end, the Attorney General's office agreed with us that it was one to make it clear to seek legislative change. So that's what we're working on now, and that is also being explained uh, very quickly through the process. And then the last uh, bill that's on our agenda is 11 D. And this has to do with providing financial assistance for career and technical education programs. Two years ago, legislation passed providing about $450,000 to fund what we call short certificates. So those programs that are not long enough to be eligible for traditional financial aid. And these programs are equally as important to businesses uh, and entities and helping students get motivated into a field of work. Uh, but because they've traditionally not had any sort of financial aid association with them, students have had a little bit more challenge in terms of paying for them. So this is part of the 2015 the first package that came out of the House uh, by partisan by uh, both sides of the aisle, both chambers, sponsoring all of the bills that was packaged. The challenge was actually implementing it that legislation requires students to be held eligible or to be eligible for that financial aid. Because those programs are not held eligible themselves, students were not completing a FAFSA form, therefore making it challenging for us as institutions to identify the students who needed this funding. We were learning about capital dollars uh, in the first year or so. We were asking for statutory change to eliminate that held eligibility requirement to require the conditions established to keep them eligibility guidance so that we can make sure the money gets the same for the students that need to use for the program. So given that our legislative agenda really is technical, I've been focusing on this year is a very strong message to the legislature about what higher education is doing, how that's important to the overall future of the state. We know through 2012, I think it was Georgetown study, that by 2020, almost three quarters of our jobs will require some level of education beyond high school. And that is what we are wrapping our heads around and focus on. So all of the programs that we are implementing uh, through the department, the work that we're doing with each of these institutions, our financial aid model, the funding allocation formula, our master plan, all of the different uh, efforts that we are engaged in are focused on meeting that goal. Uh, if we don't meet the needs of our businesses, then our businesses either have to look out for our talent or they have to go where to find talent. Because uh, we want to make sure that the Colorado economy continues to thrive. We also understand, as many of you probably do, that the state budget has a number of constitutional statutory constraints. Uh, so it's not that we are in high hopes of getting the potential this fall of money for higher education. However, we do want the legislature as policy makers and the public to start understanding why investing in higher education must be priority for everyone. Again, to meet the needs of our economy to continue to have a robust state uh, as we move forward in the future. The dollars that we have requested in our budget this year are simply asking for the state to keep up with its share of higher education uh, cost increases, I should say. We know that the state can cover all the higher education cost increases, but we want to at least not have uh, what we call our smiling crowd state, which is a chart that demonstrates that a little over a decade ago, the state is picking up two thirds of the cost of a resident student education. Um, the first is to pick up a third. Now that has reversed, and so the student is now paying for two thirds. And the $20 million request, which is our overall budget request, is essentially just sort of keeping the pace of the department of us now and not shifting to more burden over the institution, or sorry, for the student. There are, I think, a couple of bills that I would maybe point out to folks that I want to take a look at. Uh, House Bill 1154 would be a complete term of how higher education is managed in higher in Colorado. It would require the department to do, on a regular basis, a thorough review of every single degree program offered. 
supported, and that support is the initial corporate contract. Uh, and those contracts would have a number of individual, individualized, special focus metrics that the institution uh, would be working towards. And then a couple of years later, we got 13, Council 14, sorry, Dash 1319, which essentially kind of scrapped the first bill that did entirely, that told us that we didn't create a funding allocation formula that allocated the institutions based on the enrollment, their role addition, and their success in students. And so the two things have been a little bit of conflict with each other over the last several years, and we've been um, thankfully not up against trigger date or funding level to trigger that level dash 52 funding mechanism. But there's definitely been an interest in appetite by the legislature, by institutions, definitely by the joint budget committee, to eliminate that performing funding as a decision by that initial piece of legislation. So we are anticipating some sort of bill coming out of the joint budget committee around that, and we are fine with that. Uh, we have a, a very well working funding allocation formula now. Uh, certainly, if there was any specific policy uh, investments that the legislature might want to do around specific issue areas, then they can do that. Uh, there's plenty of work for to do that. Uh, we will continue to work with the institutions around simplifying, significantly simplifying performance contracts. Right now, as I said, they have a whole plethora of information and data and metrics included in them. If they are not eliminated through the Joint Budget Committee legislation, then what we would envision moving forward is that they be much more closely tied to the master plan, um, be kind of straightforward um, affirmation by the institution for helping to meet the master plan goals and that the data provided by the institution to funnel into the funding allocation formula would be the data that would be used to indicate the institution uh, in uh, an institution's health in meeting our master plan goals. So what institution has contributed to those to those goals on an annual basis, which would eliminate significant amounts of reporting now, uh, this is already being collected for the formula, and we figure things to simplify it. I hope I've been, you guys have been able to understand me. I've had a bit of a cold, so I've been wandering around here in the box, but I'm hoping, hoping that I've provided some good information. We, you've come through loud and clear. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? <coughs> I see nobody's hand up. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon. <clears throat> okay. Anybody wants to get up and get a water or whatever, we've got a next speaker should come on in about 10 minutes. <clears throat> I'm trying to get a hold of her to see if we can get her a little ahead of time, but I know that she has some meetings today.
Hello, just a quick check. Is Melissa on the line? One last quick check. Is Melissa on the line? Thank you for your patience while we wait for Melissa to join us. I said, we have no Hi, Melissa. Did you just join us? Excellent. Um, we just took a quick little break before you, but let me reconvene everybody and we can get started with your presentation. I'm pretty sure we have 20 Facebook. We did. We get gathered up. We're ready to go again. Okay, if we can get our seats taken, we'll be ready to go. Uh, Melissa, are you on the phone? I am, hello. Apparently the microphone is not. Make sure we're running here. Um, I yeah, I am on the phone. Can you not hear me? Yeah, we're going to turn the mic on. Now, try it again. Thank you, Josh. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you now, loud and clear. Okay, we're here. Um, we're having the Club 20 Education uh, Committee meeting. There's about a dozen of us here in the room. So, uh, we have with us today uh, Melissa Colson, Colson, Associate Commissioner of Student Learning for the Colorado Department of Education with an update. So I turn it over to you, Melissa, please. Great. Well, thank you all very much for this opportunity. I have, I have you on speakerphone. I think I'm just going to 
going to pick up the the um, mod, the actual um, handle and see if that helps a little bit. Does this sound more clear? Yep. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Great. Great. Well, um, I was asked to provide some updates on what's happening at the department, and I um, thought that it would be really helpful to update uh, Club 20 on the um, process to revise our academic content standards. Um, I actually presented to Club 20, I think it was two years ago, at the request of uh, Luke Ragland, and actually presented just on the implementation of the standards at that point. And we're actually at a place now where we are um, gearing up to undergo a, a statutorily required um, update of the Colorado academic standards. So I have some prepared information about that, but I'd be happy to see if there's some other questions that um, members would have and would do my very best to, um, to answer your questions. So I think I'll need somebody to um, advance the slide. Melissa, you, since you took control, you have to do it. Okay. Um, I may need I may need to give control back. <laughs> so I apologize. I, I see you moving the mouse. I, somebody's moving the mouse, and, and the pictures are changing. Oh, they are changing now. Okay. Um. So. Okay. So we're back at the beginning. Okay. So um, today what I wanted to do is again provide you um, with an update of, um, with information related to the upcoming standards review and revision process. The department has been working for the past year to prepare for this process and um, would like to kind of give you a sense of where we're headed with that. Um, so if we could advance to the next slide, thank you very much, and then one more slide. So we'll start off with just what we mean by um, what are standards. Standards are kind of broad goals that articulate what students should know, understand, or be able to do over a given time period. So um, there are standards in, in 10 different content areas in Colorado, and those standards um, do things like make sure that uh, students know particular facts, dates, and places, um, that they understand certain big ideas, such as that addition and subtraction involve taking um, things away or adding to, um, and that students are actually able to do something with that knowledge, um, such as be able to solve a one or two step word problem. And in Colorado, the way that our standards um, work is that those standards are set at the state level and are adopted by the State Board of Education. And uh, Colorado's had standards actually in place since the mid-90s. So some of you may be aware that in uh, to late 2009, we actually adopted new standards. And what that meant for your local school districts in your particular counties is they took those state standards and translated that into their local curriculum. Because districts have um, the constitutional authority in Colorado to develop their own curriculum or to actually purchase a published series. And decisions about instruction are made at the um, classroom level. So this just kind of gives you a sense of, of how, how Colorado works in terms of setting policy for what kids should know, understand, and be able to do. So the timeline, um, back in 2008, a major piece of legislation passed called Colorado's Achievement Plan for Kids. As you see on the slide here, that's abbreviated as CAPS for K. And what that did was initiate the first overhaul of Colorado standards since the mid-90s. So nothing really substantially changed with the standards that kids were learning in school um, until this piece of legislation passed. At that point, um, Colorado determined to, um, that it was necessary to kind of start from scratch and redevelop standards in all 10 content areas. And by the 10 content areas, we mean 
um, what people typically think of is, you know, they're reading, writing, and communicating, math, science, and social studies. But also, Colorado has a commitment to the arts as well. Um, I think the arts um, employs 186,000 um, uh, Coloradans, and it's a, uh, it's a, a, a workforce development kind of um, uh, process that we can look at. So we have standards in the four arts areas, which are visual arts, music, drama, theater, arts, and dance. We also have standards in comprehensive health and PE. So Colorado really has a commitment to a rich and well-balanced curriculum for kids. In 2010 is when, uh, after 2009, the board adopted our Colorado Academic Content Standards, brand new standards in all areas. The um, board voted to adopt standards in two content areas that were shared by about 45 other states, and those are the Common Core state standards. So those are just in two of the 10 content areas, math and English language arts. So in that year, the board adopted those two sets of standards. And at the end of the year, Colorado re-released its math and um, literacy standards to incorporate all of the Common Core. So the process to transition to those new standards took about three years, and districts have until the, the school year 2013-14 to transition to the new standards, update their curriculum, provide professional development, and um, implement for the first time that school year. And that's the year when the state's assessment system um, was set to align with those standards. Now, I believe that you um, have, hopefully in front of you, um, three um, additional handouts other than just the presentation that's here. It kind of gives you a sense of what the Colorado Academic Standards looks like or look like. These are some parent and community guides that give a sense of what Colorado standards ask of kids. We have guides to Colorado standards for every grade and every content area. So since there's 10 content areas, every grade has 10 different guides to show parents and community members what it is that the state standards expect of kids learning. So I believe that you have an eighth grade um, math guide, and on one side it will talk about what, what we mean by what are standards and what does middle school uh, math look like in our standards. You'll also see that this is co-produced with the Colorado PTA. On the back side, what you'll see is just some specifics about what it is a, or eighth grade math kids doing. Um, so what you'll see um, there is just kind of plain language what it is that kids are learning in that particular grade level. We thought this was important because especially I think for, from your perspective to know what it is that kids are, are learning through that progression such that as they start to transition into either college or career that there is um, a, a strong sense of alignment. In fact, CAP for K, Colorado Achievement Plan for Kids, the legislation that initiated the standards revision in 2009, was also called the Preschool Through Post-Secondary Education Act. Um, it was meant to align Colorado's education system such that all children would graduate from Colorado schools with the knowledge and skills and dispositions that they need to go into whatever area that they would like, whether it's directly into the workforce, whether it be into um, an internship program, a certificate program, or a two- or four-year program, but really that idea that there should be this seamless um, learning progression for kids from when they enter school. So that's what the standards are meant to do. Again, I think in terms of the other um, the other aspects uh, or other examples that you have, you have a fifth grade music sample that gives you a sense of what it is that kids should be learning in music. And you have an, um, a high school, I believe it's in uh, 12th grade, reading, writing, and communicating, which gives you a sense of the type of research and reasoning, oral expression and listening, reading, and, and writing, and composition skills that we want kids to know. The reason why we think this is really important is because it's the, that trajectory of learning and preparation for college and career is really the intent of the standards, and our legislative 
the, uh, our legislature actually requires that. So if we look at what it is that state law requires about our standards, well, first of all, is that it requires that we review and revise our standards every six years, such that there's that opportunity to say, are these the right things? Did we, um, did we identify the right knowledge and skills that kids need such that we have the opportunity to revisit that and determine um, the areas of improvement? And state law also requires all the different content areas that you see that we have standards in. So when I mention the 10 content areas, that's because state law actually requires it. There's actually also a set of standards or expectations that are shared between math and economics, and that's in personal financial literacy. And that was um, part of the 2008 legislation that recognized the need for all children to have that background. Uh, and if you if you think back to what was happening in 2008, 2009 with our um, the economic crisis, it seems like it makes a whole lot of sense that we would um, would. Um, make sure that kids have that background. In the last legislative session in 2016, the General Assembly passed a, um, a law to require that the state develop optional secondary computer science standards. So these will be an additional standards to Colorado's other 10 content areas that will be in place by July of 2018. And we um, actually held a, um, a regional meeting back in, um, in the, either, I think it was probably in October in um, Grand Junction to get some input on what, what should these computer science standards include. So the reason I'm telling you about some of this and we're talking, emphasizing that college and career readiness is as we start to review and revise these standards, we need to make sure that we have our business sector connected to this process. Otherwise, we won't have that college and career readiness piece in our standards, especially with respect to computer science. Having um, industry help us understand what is expected or what, what's really necessary for computer science standards. But you'll notice that it says optional secondary computer science standards. That's important because all of the other content areas that are listed here are not optional. Those are what every student should know, understand, and be able to do. Um, the, the computer science standards are meant to be optional, but districts can either choose to um, address them or not, and they're meant to, and they were um, only required at the secondary level. So. Um, that's a unique aspect of, of those standards. Um, Colorado standards should be comparable in scope, relevance, and rigor to the highest national and international standards with this idea that we need to make sure that Colorado is, is aiming for the, for the highest possible standards that are, are obviously reasonable for our kids to attain. State law also requires a number of skills be in our standards, not just reading, writing, and communicating necessarily, but that there be a, um, a, a series of skills that are woven throughout the standards. So you'll see here that our standards should require the development of creativity, innovation, critical thinking, problem solving, communication, collaboration, social and cultural awareness, civic engagement, initiative and self-direction, flexibility, productivity, accountability, character, leadership, and information technology. So what you see here is the intent of this law was to not just ensure that our kids have the content, recognizing that's necessary, but that there's also this um, need for other skills for kids to be successful in college and career. You also see these last three bullet points here are are um, it, it required as part of our standards in that our academic standards need to be aligned with career and tech ed standards, that they um, be aligned with our what we would describe as post-secondary workforce ready, and that they would lead to post-secondary workforce readiness. So that's a pretty tall order for our standards, and this is a good reason why we have an opportunity to review and revise them every six years to make sure that we're meeting all of those. So we're just about to embark on the process to, to look back at our standards and do some revisions. Now for your, the, the districts that, that are within your communities, um, the last time that we had talked that the state had looked at standards, um, they, the state completely rewrote the standards. And by state, I mean there's a number of committees, and in fact, we'll talk about that in a moment. 
but the, the old standards were essentially thrown away and new standards were developed. That's not what's intended in this process. This is meant as a refinement process. But as we um, go about this, the department is committed to the process being transparent, which is why I'm talking about it to you today and in public. That it being inclusive, that it involves key stakeholders, which is why um, we think it's very important that we are thinking about the bridge to um, career um, and industry. That it be informed by research, looking at what we've learned from other states, that the process be consistent and aligned with what is required in statute, that it be focused on the substance of the standards, not about um, whether or not we should go in a certain direction, but really looking carefully at the standards to say, is this what kids should not going to be able to do? And it be improvement oriented, that we focus on improving what exists based on stakeholder feedback. So with those principles in mind, we have been working to prepare the, um, our process, and our process kind of involves four key players. The very center, you'll see the State Board of Education. The reason they're at the center is because they are the ones statutorily authorized to um, adopt revisions to the standards. So it is their responsibility to oversee this process, to help with decision making, and ultimately, once the process is complete, to determine whether or not the um, revision should be adopted. At the top, at 12 o'clock, you'll see in blue the stakeholders, and that's you, um, as well as our K-12 educators, community members, parents, um, institutions of higher education, early childhood providers, um, and our classroom teachers especially. Um, we're relying on stakeholders to take a look at those standards and provide some feedback. Um, help us um, know, help us provide the right information to what you'll see in the, at about 4 o'clock on this diagram, our, our review committees. We will be, and in fact right now, we are recruiting um, committee members to actually um, do the review process. The department's role is not to conduct this review ourselves. Our role is to help facilitate this by bringing the right information to the right individuals to help conduct that review. So we'll have review committees in each of the content areas. So it'll be a math committee, a, um, a, a music committee, a science committee, and so on. So one committee for each content area, and a committee for computer science, which will be a new, a new um, content area. But their job will be to review the standards and then provide recommendations to the state board to consider. Our job, CDE staff, we're right there at about um, uh, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock um, in the other greenish color. Um, our job is to facilitate the process and to staff the committees, meaning be there to support the committee to do their work. We don't have a, a staff member's decision-making authority. Our job is to help our, our committee members make good recommendations so that our, our state board has um, good recommendations to adopt. So what's this going to look like? It's kind of in four stages. The first stage, the yellow stage, is what we've been doing for the last year. We've been doing a whole lot of research as a department, um, gathering information. Um, we conducted a survey. I'm going to talk to you a little bit in a few minutes about an online system. We also commissioned some um, reports to help us, um, some analysis of our current standards to just give it um, a starting place. The green box, the second, um, the second box that you'll see, is the, the second phase, and we're actually just transitioning to that. Is we're just now recruiting our committee members. So our committee members are going to look at all of the information that is provided to them, review the standards, and make some initial recommendations. The blue box is the third phase, which is those recommendations for the revisions are going to be made public. And the state board will have an opportunity to um, look at and consider what the committees recommend. And we will have a process to ensure that all Coloradans have that same opportunity to see what the changes are that are recommended. And at that point, we'll have another opportunity for feedback to say, what do you think of these recommendations? The committees will then take that public input, and in the very last box, they're going to make any revisions that they have to their initial recommendations, and then provide um, their final um, recommendations to the state board. So it's a four-phase process, and we're in about phase 1.5. We're just about ready to get those committees together. So where does, how does this look on a timeline? 
well. Um, in terms of school years, which is how educators tend to look at the, the years, um, uh, this school year, 16-17, is our planning and resource development process. We actually begin to convene our committees. The school year 17-18 um, will be the completion of the review and revision process, and then by July 2018 is when the state board is required to have adopted any revisions. What you'll see in the next um, two boxes, um, the school year 2018-19 and the school year 2019-20, is the opportunity for districts to make any revisions to their local curriculum based on any revisions that are necessary. So if there are if there are um, content areas that don't have much revision, that won't look very that that will be a, a really easy list for districts. Um, if there's more substantial pieces, that time will be very much appreciated by districts. So the, the first year of implementation of any changes to the standards will be in the 2020, 2021 school year. So that's kind of what it looks like in a nutshell. Um, I'm going to show you, I'm actually gonna skip over this. I'm gonna show you what's active right now. Um, right now, Every Coloradan can go to this um, to a website, and we have a link on the last page, I think, of the of the presentation. We have an online standards review system. What this does is, and you can see like a general um, like picture of it on the left, is it basically allows um, individuals to take a look at the, the standards, and every one of those little blue icons on the right side of each of those boxes um, on, the, on the screen is a little um, uh, uh, comment box. So if you click on that comment box on any one of those, um, any Colorado can provide specific feedback on any part of the standard. So if there's something that, if, if someone were to look at the um, high school science standards and say, wow, I don't think this is asking enough of our kids, you ought to consider this, there's an opportunity to write the action, the, your comments in, in that particular box. Or if there's a, um, if you were to look at something and say, I don't know that this is really that important for kids to learn, you can recommend that it's removed from the standards and provide some rationale. What we'll be doing with all of this feedback is all of it will be collated and given to those committees that we were talking about. So all the math commons go to the math committee, all the science commons go to the science committee, and so on. So it's that these committee members are going to be given the actual feedback from Colorado on what, if any, revisions they would like to recommend. So these committee members won't be working in isolation, they'll be using the actual feedback from Colorado. So that system is open through the end of April, and currently we are recruiting for our committees that will be actually doing this work, and we're really interested in having um, uh, representation from different sectors and geographic regions of the state. So for instance, we're very interested in ensuring that we have representation on those committees from each level within the school system, higher education, community members, parents, and business. We're very interested in ensuring we have um, geographic regions covered. Um, what we'll be doing is for those folks who will, um, will need to travel to participate, they'll be, giving, be given um, reimbursement for their travel. For educators who would participate um, and would have to miss a day out of their classroom for any of the meetings, they'll be given a stipend to pay for their substitutes. We're also looking at making sure we have representation of the different needs of kids. Um, and we're looking for folks who have some expertise in standards-related work, but we also recognize that folks from the business sector may not have that experience, and for them that, that um, we won't be looking for that from our, our colleagues and friends in the business sector. We will be looking for folks who are willing to participate, however. So our timeline for the application process is, is um, up on the screen right now. The um, application just opened a little over a week ago, and we'll, uh, the window for applications will be through March 15th. What we'll do is, after that point, we'll um, review the applications, and we're using a blind review process, meaning the applications will be reviewed based on the merit of the application, not by based on the, the person's name. So, for instance, we might know someone, 
um, who has applied to the committee. Our goal is to not go with just those folks that we know, but instead to say, let's look at the merits of the application and those are the folks who should be on the committee. Um, we'll be notifying applica applicants at the end of March and announce the committee members at the beginning of April. So there's a number of ways to be involved, and we're very much hoping that some of you will consider, I hope that all of you would consider being involved in some way, shape, or form, um, recognizing that not everyone has the ability to participate in, in um, all of the opportunities that come your way. But first, we would recommend or request that you consider providing your input on the online standards feedback system. So if you have kids at a particular grade level, um, or you're really interested in um, a particular content area or a particular grade level, um, please consider um, participating in, in that process. Um, we have a dedicated email box that if there are just some things that you think that we ought to be considering when we do this work, that you can put your information there. You can sign up to receive updates on the standards review and revision process. And you can um, apply to be on a committee or you can recruit some members. So we encourage that process. We're also looking at some ways that we can involve our, um, our business sector, perhaps in ways that may not be necessarily serving on a committee. Um, one thing that we're looking at specifically for computer science, but that we would consider for other content areas, is to perhaps have some focus groups of, um, of, of uh, business and um, leaders to take a look at some of the recommendations for the revisions, not necessarily be on a committee, um, but instead just look at the recommendations and provide us some of that feedback, um, recognizing that um, folks who are running in business may not have the time to commit to this. Finally, um, just a few um, resources that you can find if you're interested to dig in a little bit more. So those guides that I referenced earlier um, are available on our website and there's um, a link there. Um, there's also some information there if you want to know a little bit of history of what's happened with the standards work. We also have an FAQ document. But again, this, because this is all about leading to post-secondary workforce readiness, we are um, really interested in making sure that we have uh, your, um, your knowledge of this work and hopefully your involvement as well. But I would like to you know, open up for any questions you have about this or if there's some other things happening in education um, that you have questions about, I'll do my best to answer those. And if I can't answer them here, I will follow up. Okay, thank you very much. And we've got a question. Yes, ma'am. I'm Don Mathis from up in Rock County. I did have a question about the standards. It looks like the core math, English, and science and stuff are really uh, emphasized here. But uh, coming from a medical background, I look at a whole uh, intelligence balance and want to kind of address something uh, the health and wellness aspect and life skills. You know, we stress so much about the course of intelligence and English, math, and so forth, but we really don't stress a lot about diet, nutrition, physical education as much as we used to. Yeah. And with that, you know, the decrease in medicine, decrease, decrease in obesity, decrease in uh, medical and mental health issues. And a question for you, I, I'm seeing this, but I don't see a ratio uh, from the core to the other life skills. And when we talk about this, you talk about workforce readiness. You know, I'm yeah. seeing a lot of uh, career type things with a four-year bachelor's degree. I'm seeing lawyers. I'm thinking that just stuff like that. But on the front range, what about the first responders, the police, the military, yeah. construction trades, farming, ranching, oil, gas, energy, and mining? How do we prepare our kids for that to keep the lifeblood of the Western Slope open? What are we doing as a state of Colorado to balance those skills out? And how do we get uh, the life skills in there, especially to help with some of the other top 10 mortality rate issues? What are we doing with that with our schools? How, how do we forecast that? Can you answer that for me, please? I know it's pretty in-depth. Yeah. Well, I'll first say, first, that's an excellent question. And I think those are the right questions that, that um, we ought to be engaging in with relation to what kids are learning in, um, in school with respect to the standards. First of all, we do 
Yeah, Colorado um, in 2009 when they first kind of did a re revamp of all of our standards actually add comprehensive health to the physical education standards and essentially I mean, ensuring that there is that look at ensuring kids understand nutrition, understand stress relief, understand um, the, the uh, physical activity that's necessary, not just from going to PE, but really understanding why that's helpful to have a kind of a well-balanced life. So there is, um, there is that piece within the Colorado Academic Standards, and it's new. Now, just because it's there, does that mean that it's adequately addressed in schools? That, that's, a, that's a great question to be asking of your local school districts to say, how well are we actually addressing what's in those standards? Because there's, there's a great opportunity to help with exactly what you're saying, address not just physical education um, from the, you know, I remember PE being a lot of playing volleyball and running laps. <laughs> our, our Colorado Academic Standards and Physical Education Health are both encouraging and ensuring that kids have physical activity, but they also under, are learning about why that's important for their, their physical and mental health. So that is part of the standards, and again, whether or not those are adequately addressed, I think is, is really a matter of the, the resources that districts have in order to address those well, um, and the creativity that they have in understanding how to, how to um, do that, how to pull that off in the classroom. Uh, we've had a project at the department that actually helps translate some of those, uh, some of that uh, focus on comprehensive health into other content areas um, because we recognize that teachers will say, I barely have enough time to get through my content. How am I also going to teach kids about health? And so we've, act, we've engaged a number of educators to help create some instructional units, not that the state has created, but that educators in Colorado that help to integrate those skills into other content areas so that teachers can see you can actually teach, um, you can actually use um, science as a vehicle for understanding some of the, um, understanding the importance of, of um, healthy nutrition and so on. Um, could we do better with that? I am um, positive that we could. But your second um, point around really looking strategically at kind of what the, the workforce needs are in terms of sustaining kind of the, uh, the, the different um, sectors in, um, in Colorado's economy. You know, I, I think that um, I think that there's a lot of work that can be done there, um, bridging the gap between what businesses and what are um, what uh, what job opportunities exist with what's happening in schools can be a, a real challenge. I think the um, the uh, there's a, is it, I'm going to say career wise is that the the new apprenticeship program that's being um, uh, integrated. I think Mesa 51 might be working with that. But I think that that's a, I think a good illustration of how education really needs the role of business not to be, you know, a philanthropist and come in and give money or hey set up an internship program, but help to um, help to actually get more involved and help education kind of know where to, where to focus so that we're kind of creating those opportunities for kids. Again, we, you know, this is a really, that's a really big question that requires, I think, um, a lot of great conversations in local communities like you're having. Any other questions? Uh, Steve. Hi, uh, this is Steve Child um, from Pitkin County, and I'm a retired school teacher. I taught mostly first and second grade. So my question has to do with how how you have these committees set up. Would one committee look at, say, the math curriculum for K through 12, or would they specialize more on K through 5, for instance? And do you also have a committee that would look at just specifically elementary education and not look at the high school standards? for instance, yeah. uh, because it's so special. Yeah, that's a, Thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a really good question. And, and um, so, and, and by the way, uh, thank you for teaching first and second grade. I, I was a middle school teacher, and my best friend is a, uh, an elementary teacher. She taught first grade, and she would always say, I could never do your job, and I would always assure her, absolutely, I could never do yours. So I have so much respect for early elementary teachers. Uh, so the, the committees are going to be structured by content area, but our intention is to say that within, for instance, the math committee, that we would have um, we would have early elementary grade teachers, so a couple of teachers at the primary grades, a couple of teachers at the um, at the intermediate grades, a couple of teachers for middle school, and a couple of teachers for high school. And a couple is termed, you know, is, is used a little bit loosely, but just to make sure that there's, you know, more than one at each of those grade spans to kind of look holistically across those grades and to say, um, how, how do we see that, you know, are, are there any gaps in what kids would be learning across this? Um, is there any redundancy we need to get rid of? So, so we really want to capture the expertise of those grade level teachers because as, as you are very much aware, um, your perspective as a primary grade teacher, um, you know what kids are capable of at those grades, and you know much better than a fifth grade teacher what a first grader can do. And so, it's really we think it's really important to have the, that um, that expertise on the committee. We back in 2009, we did have opportunities to look. Um, to, to have our elementary teachers look across all of the subject areas as well, so that we could look across and say, are we seeing, are we seeing that what kids are learning in math does it work well with what's happening in science at those, you know, at you know, at K one two? Um, how are we seeing that that works with social studies? So we 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 do have a process to kind of look across um, across subject areas within a grade as well, because we know that that's really important. And with your experience teaching those grades, you know that it's it's really important that kids have connected learning such that they can see how one subject relates to another. And so we do have a mechanism built in for that. Okay, thank you so much. much. <clears throat> yes, uh, just sure. wondering how the standards fit into the apprentice program and then where we are on the budget, state budget. Oh, so you throw in the budget one for an easy question, huh? <laughs> so um, so I'll, I'll do the other one first. So where do the standards fit with the apprentice program? You know, I think that I think that the there's some interesting ways that uh, that different apprentice programs kind of address the standards, whether or not it's um, kind of taking a look at the um, at the time that kids are spending in 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 the classroom setting, as well as how long what they're doing within their apprenticeship, and looking at kind of compressing some of that classroom learning a, a bit more, such that there's. Um, an opportunity to make sure that kids are learning what the standards are asking for, um, but then making that that um, connection to what they're learning in their apprenticeship. I think there's a lot to be learned in that process, and, and I'm really excited to see the pilot programs that are going up in Colorado because, as we've seen from, I think our model has been for Colorado's program has been. If, if, if you're talking about the apprentice program that that um, is going into Mesa 51, is modeled after an apprentice program um, from Switzerland, which is really meant to tie much more what happens in the classroom to what they're learning um, in their apprenticeship program. I think there's just, just a whole lot of promise there, and I think there's just a whole lot of excitement for what could be for kids who may not be as able to make the connection between what they're learning in seed time to what they're ultimately going to do in life. I think that there's plenty of kids that we've probably all had um, experience with, whether or not it's you know a relative or um, maybe it was yourself, that sitting in a classroom and learning something is it just it isn't sufficient. Um, there needs to be something that's hands-on. There needs to be something that shows me why is this important? When am I ever going to use this? So I think we have as a state a lot to learn from um, from a, apprenticeship programs, um, and I think that districts will need a lot of support in being able to do those well, because I think there is a tension between saying are we quote covering 
the, enough of the his material that kids need to learn um, in the time that they're in a classroom setting and feeling like are we losing time from quote learning the academic learning when kids are in the, you know, doing their apprenticeships. Um, I don't think that those things would be mutually exclusive at all. But I think that takes that takes a lot of trust that that um, that kids are able to make that connection um, between what they're learning in the, in the classroom setting. In relation to the budget, I think there's there's still quite a bit of conversations going on. I, I, um, you know, this this is a year where, and and by the way, I'm not the school finance expert, so I'm going to give a very very high level view. But um, but but I think we are looking at, um, you know, still the specter of what's called the negative factor for our districts, which um, is, um, is is essentially um, going to restrict some funding. Um, we're at a point in terms of the budget where, um, uh, in order to increase any funding, we're going to run up against um, the Tabor Amendment. Um, so I think the the legislature really has its um, work cut out for it um, for itself this year to try to create a budget um, based on some projections that are not quite as rosy as we would like them to be. Um, this is. It, it is a challenging time. Uh, I know that you know as, as bills come forward, legislators are looking very carefully at any fiscal notes that are attached to them because um, passing any legislation that is going to cost the state is there's there's just not room in the budget for that right now. So um, yeah, I think it's 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 going to be I think, I think it's going to be a tough year. Um, how how tough um, is yet to be finally determined. I will say one thing is just to keep in mind that the, the department um, the department does not make decisions about funding for schools. That that really comes through the legislature. So. Um, so I'm not, I'm not trying to pass the buck, but I am trying to just make sure you know that you know that it's not these, these are decisions that the department makes. Put the blame those lens too. Huh? <laughs> Any other questions? What is that? Okay. And Ray Beck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, this is Ray Beck, Moffat County. Um, are you looking at any particular legislation that uh, you think is, is prudent that would help um, education? I mean, I'm looking at this one here where it says modern technology education in public schools. Uh, and, and like you alluded to, um, the budgets are going to be, well, the long bill is going to be critical to any funding that we would get in rural Colorado. But I will tell you this negative factor is going to impact us hugely um, and rural communities have not, in my opinion, recovered from the recession of 2008, 2009. And so we're all scratching to figure it out. And it's just not our schools, it's our counties and our cities uh, throughout uh, Western Colorado. So um, I was just wondering what piece of legislation, if any, uh, would be, uh, let's put, for lack of a better word, positive, that we could maybe cling to, look to, Whatever that might look like. What, what, you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's that's a good question. You know, I um, at the Department of Education, we're we're a little bit different than other state agencies in that um, our head of our agency, our commissioner, does not sit on the governor's cabinet. So our so we're not. Um, we, we, we don't fall underneath the governance necessarily as a governor, that we're governed by an elected state board of education, just like your local school districts are governed by the local school district or local um, school board. So the reason I say that is because the, um, the state board is the, the um, who, our state board is responsible for setting the legislative policy for the department. And as they've set up kind of their legislative priorities for the department, um, they have not identified specific legislation that they would like to see um, passed in this session. Other agencies typically will have 
um, put forward because they're working with the governor kind of have a um, perhaps a legislative agenda for the year. So we don't necessarily have a legislative agenda. Instead, the board has articulated some principles that they would like to follow in terms of whether or not they'll support different legislation. I think in terms of just, you know, if you talk to your local superintendents about what they would like to see, I think the majority of them would say focusing on the negative factor is the number one priority. That's what we hear from the Colorado Association of School Executives, which is the Association of Superintendents for the state. That's been what they've worked, that they've really um, emphasized as their priority. And, and we haven't heard, um, we haven't heard a, a, a large um, uh, kind of a combined request for a particular legislative agenda from school districts. Um, since 2008, there's been a tremendous amount of, of uh, education reform um, initiatives that have gone through the legislature. And I think right now, most school districts are just focused on that and aren't interested in having more legislation. Um, in 2008 is when that cap and pay bill passed and changed, um, changed our standards, updated our assessment system. 2009, our accountability system was overhauled. In 2010, our educator effectiveness law passed. In 2012, an early literacy bill passed called the Colorado Read Act. Um, and um, just last year, there was a major data privacy bill that passed. So I think, um, you know, I, I think that legislating ourselves, you know, uh, out of where we are right now economically is probably not going to happen. Um, and again, you know, I can't speak for what the policies or the what the, the department would say are legislative uh, priorities. That would have to be the the um, state board. But again, you know, just to reiterate, I think that you know our district really said that we've got our hands full doing our work. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Melissa, thank you very much for your time and calling in. We appreciate it. Have a good day. Well, thank you all for the invitation. I hope you have a great rest of your day. We will. And you have got good news. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks, bye-bye. Our next bye -bye. speakers can't make it. Well, George is going to go off. I'll speak on behalf Oh, well, good. <laughs> we got George. <laughs> I thought we were going to have Senator Bennett's office here and Senator Gardner's office as well, but they couldn't make it. So I'll just speak a little bit on um, what's happening in the House side. So we're always asked a lot of questions about the President's Cabinet. That's something that the House of Representatives don't get to vote on. So it's strictly by the Senate only. So... I can't answer any of those questions. So, Congressman Tipton is actually in Germany. He is back on a delegation. So, he's got a congressional delegation back there. So, I believe he comes back tomorrow. So, everybody got a little break, but he didn't get one. So, um, we'll be in session all of March. The next time we'll be out of session will be in April. Um, it's been a crazy 30 days, so we I don't think our office has ever been as busy as it has been in the last about five weeks. So um, we're averaging probably 75 calls a day. Um, lines come in, three lines are ringing at the same time. So um, lots of people come into our doors. We're getting a really a lot of great constituent contact. So... Uh, Anybody that wants to come visit, please come on by. So, I mean, we've got had commissioners come, uh, and I've been there over a couple of years, and very seldom do we have a lot of the city council and commissioners stop by. So, it's, it's, that part has been great. So, everything gets feedback back to the congressman, and um, it's been fun. It's been hectic and crazy, and um, but... Uh, yeah, a lot has happened in the last five weeks. So we're looking for more. I think as the cabinet fills up, more things will start happening. Um, we'll get some legislation through. But right now, um, we're just holding on and hanging in there. And the congressman is doing very well. 
Anything I can try and answer? I've talked to most of you while I've been here today, so yeah. All right, that's a little bit of an update we've got. Oh, yeah, great. Right. 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 Thank you for asking the question. We're going to let you off. We appreciate you being here. And no problem. Appreciate Congressman Kiffin and all the work you've done for Western Colorado. Um, are you guys getting uh, a lot of uh, calls and, and letters, et cetera, based on the uh, new administration, like uh, Cory Gardner's offices? Yes, we are. <laughs> so. That's a good way to put it. Uh, we are. We're getting the the part that we don't do is like the cabinet, like I say. So that, and we're still getting those calls, and we let everyone know, you know, that even though that, but that part doesn't matter. But we still pass that along to the congressman. So even though we don't get, or the congressman does not get that vote. We still pass on everyone's thoughts back to the congressman. So yes, but we are still we're getting the calls and the letters the same way. Yeah. Every once in a while, we'll have forty postcards come in um, in one day. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Both Linda Yes, Steve. Yes, Steve. Um, what committees does the congressman sit on? The I know the committees are where things really happen. Absolutely. Financial Services Committee, and this year he did get back on the Natural Resources Committee. So he was on that for a while, and last year, he, or last Congress, he did get off and was strictly just on financial services, but this, this Congress, he's on both. So, and I know. He just loves working on public land issues. So I think it's, it was a good move to get him back on that, or that he really wanted back on that committee. Any other, Any questions? other questions? We're adjourned. I'd like to talk about the budget. Okay. Good job. Well, I don't know about the job, but it was a pleasure. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day and a great weekend if we don't see you tomorrow.